Good afternoon, and thank you very much for attending my talk today on gastrointestinal issues in regards to diabetes. It's always a pleasure for me to speak at the TCOYD conferences, and I want to give a shout out to my good friend Steve Edelman for inviting me and asking me to talk today. Please bear with me. This is not my wheelhouse to give talks virtually, but in this day and age of COVID and all that we've been through, it's becoming a reality for all of us. My name is Dr. Jamie Wallison. I'm a gastroenterologist at the Sharpe Staley Medical Group here in San Diego, and I'm the chair of our Department of Medical Specialties. I've been a gastroenterologist for over 30 years and have had a lot of experience taking care of patients with gastrointestinal problems, not only with diabetes, but also all types of, of patients. But welcome on board, and hopefully we can have an entertaining uh, afternoon today. As a gastroenterologist, this is typically what I see in my office. Uh, an individual will come into the office complaining of abdominal pain, and it's usually very generalized. Its features may be nonspecific, and it's our job to try to figure out what is causing this problem? Is it in the esophagus, the stomach, the liver? Oftentimes it's very difficult. And the history that individuals present to us is really the most important portion of the, uh, of the diagnosis. There are very many different types of problems that we see in a typical gastroenterology consultation. Uh, and some of these are unique to diabetes, but most of them are not. Uh, the types of problems that I see in my own practice uh, in terms of going from most common to less common would include abdominal pain, irritable bowel syndrome, constipation, diarrhea, acid irritation problems such as acid reflux and ulcers, fatty liver disease, which is one of the more common problems that we see nowadays, along with less common conditions such as ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. We also do many procedures in gastroenterology and about 50% of my time is spent doing consultations and seeing patients in the office and about 50% doing various gastrointestinal procedures. Diabetes is somewhat unique in that it can have profound impacts on the gastrointestinal tract. But we know that GI problems are common with and without diabetes. So most of what I see in diabetics who are having stomach troubles are not directly related to the diabetes, but rather are just a general manifestation of malfunction of the digestive tract. It's been reported that up to three quarters of people with diabetes will have GI problems, but that's not unique. And it's probably similar in the general medical population, including those who don't have diabetes. But there are a certain uh, number of conditions that have an increased incidence within diabetics. One of the most common problems that we see are liver test abnormalities in fatty liver. Fatty liver oftentimes does present as abdominal pain because as the liver becomes engorged with fat, it distends and that causes an aching discomfort in the upper abdomen. And this is very common. Uh, when we talk about fatty liver, the overall generic term that we use is called non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And it's mainly related to obesity, metabolic syndrome, which includes obesity, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and uh, insulin resistance, but also high triglycerides are associated. And then also, of course, high blood sugars. We see non-alcoholic fatty liver disease in both diabetics and non-diabetics. But when we see it in Caucasian individuals in the absence of a high blood sugar, we usually think about prediabetes because it's all part of the pre-diabetic spectrum, including insulin resistance. When simple fatty liver becomes more severe, there is inflammation in the liver 
associated with that fat. And we call that non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. The abbreviation is NASH. And that's where there's inflammation in the liver associated with the fat. And that's the more important condition that we worry about because it is associated with progression of liver problems and even the development of cirrhosis. So that's what we're on the lookout for. And when that is occurring, it's time to do something, something stringent to really get rid of the fat in the liver. Non-alcoholic fatty liver, as I mentioned, is really just simple fat buildup within the liver. There's minimal in inflammation. Liver tests tend to be low. There may or may not be symptoms. NASH is where there's inflammation and possibly even scar tissue. And then cirrhosis is where advanced scarring of the liver occurs, which may result from fatty liver. And once cirrhosis develops, there are a whole array of complications that can arise from that. Uh, things such as bleeding, fluid retention. You really don't want to get to that point, but it is fairly common with fatty liver. The main risk factors for fatty liver are obesity. In this cartoon, uh, a bunch of ducks have got a funnel in the mouth of a chef and they're saying, hey, Steve, give me more cheeseburgers. So for those of you who eat foie gras, you'll know that foie gras is actually fatty duck liver. And the way that they make that fatty liver is by putting a feeding tube into ducks and then overfeeding them until their livers get very fatty. It's kind of creepy, uh, but that's how they do the, how they make the foie gras. But obesity, metabolic syndrome, type two diabetes, high cholesterol and triglyceride are the main risk factors for fatty liver. Fatty liver is actually present in nearly one half of the adult population now related to obesity. And about 20% of those will have the more serious NASH or fatty hepatitis. And of those who have that fatty hepatitis, up to 20% will develop cirrhosis and all the complications that go along with that. So it is a serious problem and it's a very large problem. The main treatment for fatty liver disease is weight loss and exercise. And there's no easy fix here. There's no magic bullet. This is what all of us would like to see. Snap your fingers and you lose 100 pounds of weight. But unfortunately, it's not that easy by any means. The treatment and the hallmark is weight loss and exercise. Uh, exercise is independently related to improvement in fatty liver, meaning that if you're overweight, and you start and you have fatty liver and you start exercising, even just walking 15, 20 minutes a day, four or five times a week, the fatty liver will get better, even if you don't lose any weight. Of course, the goal is to lose weight, however, whatever it takes, whatever diet you want to use, exercise along with it, and the fat will get sucked out of the liver in most cases. A bariatric or weight loss surgery also is an option for more serious uh, fatty liver. Obviously, it's an invasive procedure, and we don't usually recommend that unless there's really a strong indication. But bariatric surgery is probably the most effective treatment of any of these we'll talk about. Interestingly, coffee has been associated with decreased development of fibrosis or scar tissue in the liver. So there is some benefit from coffee. It's also associated with a decreased risk of liver cancer in those people who have cirrhosis. There have been several studies looking at vitamin E, primarily 800 international units per day. And this does provide benefit uh, for fatty liver and prevention of progression. The studies are not very robust but there is data that suggests that. The only problem with vitamin E is that in men, it may, and the big question mark, may be associated with prostate cancer, but we don't really know for sure. Pioglitazone or Actos also has been studied and is beneficial for fatty liver. Unfortunately, 
Pioglitazone is associated with weight gain, and it's not used very commonly uh, because of that. The GLP-1 agonists like Victoza, Bieta, uh, Ozempic are, uh, may be associated with improvement in fatty liver. There's no, they're, it, they're not FDA approved for that, but they may show some benefit. And then finally, obeticolic acid is an agent that uh, has been used for treatment of uh, fatty liver. There's several clinical trials that do show benefit, but it is not FDA approved yet. There are a variety of experimental agents that have been utilized, uh, but none of these are FDA approved yet. Again, the hallmark, the, the key to treating fatty liver is weight loss and exercise. And the weight loss comes from eating properly. And I love this, this cartoon, uh, couples at a Mexican food restaurant, and they say, we'd like something low in fat and sodium. What do you recommend? Another restaurant. So choose wisely when you are eating. The key really to keeping your liver healthy and taking it from a sick fatty liver is weight loss and exercise. And that's, you don't have to be a marathon runner, but you need to do a little bit. Dr. Edelman had asked that I include a conversation about wheat and celiac as it relates to diabetics, because this is a very common question that comes up. And we do know that celiac disease, which we'll be talking about, is associated with type one diabetes, but not so much with type two. But people have so many questions about wheat these days, I thought that it would be a good idea to talk about this. Celiac disease, is associated with type 1 diabetes, and it is an immune-mediated condition, an autoimmune condition, in which susceptible individuals react to gluten and develop inflammation and injury to the lining of the small intestine or gut. Gluten is the protein that's present in wheat, rye, and barley. It's present in all of our pastas and all of our breads. Now, this is different than a wheat allergy. Wheat allergy is a true allergic reaction to one or several of the components of wheat. And that might cause things like rashes, wheezing, hives. It's an acute allergic reaction, very different than celiac. More common in kids, not very common at all in adults. And then the final issue is about gluten sensitivity. And this is what most of us hear about Everybody and their brother who's got a gut symptom feels that they have gluten intolerance. It's a little bit of a fad right now, but there are many people who just do not digest and absorb gluten properly. It's an intolerance, but it's not celiac and it's not a true allergy. It's not an autoimmune reaction. It's just a series of GI symptoms that occur because gluten and wheat is not properly digested, it may be fermented by some of the bacteria in your gut, and it may lead to bloating, gas, and diarrhea. Celiac disease is not very common. In healthy individuals, it's less than 1% in the United States. In first-degree relatives of individuals with celiac, it's up to 10% may have it. And in type 1 diabetics, up to 10% of individuals may have or will develop celiac. And in people with irritable bowel who have maybe diarrhea, constipation, abdominal bloating, maybe up to 5% of those individuals will have celiac. But the key is with the type 1 diabetics, and if you are type 1 diabetic, you really want to be checked periodically with a blood test for celiac if you are having GI symptoms. So what happens with celiac? Celiac is an autoimmune reaction to gluten. Again, it's the protein that's present in wheat, rye, and barley, and it leads to actual destruction of the lining of the small intestine. 
Because of that, you can't absorb your food properly. There's a lot of diarrhea, there's cramping, there may be skin rashes, fatigue, joint aches and pains, all kinds of symptoms can develop with celiac. And there can be malnutrition with vitamin deficiencies if it's severe. I like this picture, the woman's hiding behind a stack of, of pancakes and those of course have a lot of wheat and gluten in them. When we look at the small intestine with endoscopy, this is what we see. The lining of the intestine is covered with all these little, these fine finger-like projections that are called villi. And that's how you absorb your food. The villi cover the entire intestine and increase the surface area of the intestine so that you can absorb your food better. With celiac, what happens is that those villi get eroded and the intestine becomes very flat and it can't absorb properly. The symptoms are nonspecific. I mentioned earlier, diarrhea, weight loss, fat in the stool because you can't absorb it, bloating, gas, food intolerances, uh, very nonspecific. Uh, and for some people, there may even be no symptoms. Uh, maybe there's some iron deficiency or osteoporosis. So you have to be on the lookout for this one. It can be a sneaky bugger. So how do you tell? Are you gluten intolerant or do you have celiac? Is it an allergy? Uh, allergy is, is done with allergy testing and blood tests. But for a diagnosis of celiac, you really want to start with a blood test called a TTG antibody. And that TTG antibody is present in almost everyone, nearly 100% of people who have celiac. It's simple, it's easy, it's cheap, and it's a great screen. If it's positive, or if there's symptoms suggesting celiac and the blood test is negative, then we would go with endoscopy and we would take biopsies of the intestine, which will usually tell us. Genetic testing is available, but it's only occasionally helpful. And the reason being that it's not very specific, about 40% of the general population test positive on the genetic assay. And of those, only a very small fraction, 1% or less actually have celiac. So it's not a very good test. It's helpful in people who are gluten-free and have been for years, and you're trying to figure out if they have celiac, because when you're on a gluten-free diet, that TTG antibody will become negative in most cases. So the treatment of celiac, pretty straightforward, a gluten-free diet, not always as easy as it sounds, but that means no wheat, rye, and barley. Oats, in theory, are gluten-free, but sometimes the oats are produced in factories that mill wheat products, so they may have a contamination. And we oftentimes will recommend staying away from oats early on, but then reintroducing them. So these are all the foods that are loaded with gluten, uh, salad dressings, bread, pastas, donuts, uh, beer has a lot of gluten, and don't forget the coating that they put onto rotisserie chicken, that can do it as well. But you know, there's lots of great food that's gluten-free, and there is gluten-free pasta, which is great, but all the fresh fruits, all the vegetables, uh, even their gluten-free wines, there are gluten-free beers, but you have to be really careful with those. And uh, alcohols uh, are gluten-free. So I, I'm going to stop on talking about celiac right now. And I hope that's just really a brief overview. And I hope that that's helpful. And of course, if you have questions, we can always talk at the uh, other session that we'll be having later on uh, today. Let's talk a bit about stomach abnormalities and diabetes. And one of the questions that comes up very frequently is about gastroparesis, which is delayed emptying of the stomach. Many people with diet, longstanding diabetes, type 1 or type 2, will develop neuropathy. And that neuropathy can affect the stomach and the small intestine as well. When it happens in the stomach, the stomach just doesn't empty properly. And it may happen uh, in over half of people with diabetes, if you measure very carefully, but point of fact, only about 5% or less of people with diabetes will ever develop symptomatic gastroparesis. 
The symptoms of delayed stomach emptying include fullness with meals, weight loss, nausea, mainly vomiting. Vomiting is a, can be a prominent uh, feature, bloating, and then difficult to control blood sugars because what happens is that you eat and you expect that your blood sugars will rise, your insulin need will be high. So the insulin or the, is given right after a meal, but then the stomach doesn't empty for several hours when it should empty right away. It doesn't empty for four or six hours and the blood sugars don't start to rise from the food being absorbed in the small intestine for four to six or seven hours. And the insulin that's given causes low blood sugar. And then seven hours later, the blood sugar is really high. So it can really be problematic. Uh, for those of you who have continuous glucose monitoring, you can, you can actually see how fast it takes for your stomach to empty by monitoring the blood sugar curve after meals. There are many medications that slow down the emptying of the stomach. There are antispasm medicines that are given. There are pain medicines and narcotic analgesics that really slow down the emptying of the stomach. Uh, the GLP-1 agonists like exenatide, liraglutide, semaglutide, those all empty the, delay the emptying of the stomach, which is beneficial for some people because it causes weight loss, but for other people it can worsen symptoms. Now, there are a lot of conditions that cause vomiting. Not everybody who has diabetes and is vomiting has gastroparesis. One of the big uh, items that we're seeing nowadays in diabetics and non-diabetics a lot is a syndrome called cannabinoid hyperemesis. That means if you're smoking too much marijuana, it can have a really bad impact on your stomach and make you vomit. And it can be confused very easily with gastroparesis. So how do we diagnose gastroparesis? First of all, clinical symptoms are helpful, but not diagnostic. Plain x-rays of the stomach may show that it's distended with food. An upper GI x-ray may show delayed emptying of the stomach and a distended dilated stomach. Upper endoscopy sometimes can be helpful showing retained food in the stomach. But the, the most important test is the nuclear medicine gastric emptying study and that will show that the stomach is emptying too slowly. There are more sophisticated studies measuring stomach motility and the uh, EMG, which is, measures the activity of the muscles in the stomach, but those are rarely done except as on an experimental basis. The treatment of gastric, a diabetic gastroparesis, uh, first and foremost includes closer control of blood sugars, because we know that if your blood sugars are really high, that in and of itself will slow down the emptying of the stomach. But this can be difficult in the face of erratic stomach emptying, as we talked about earlier. As far as dietary measures go, a food that is low, low residue and very soft can be helpful. For instance, yogurt might be easier to tolerate than uh, uh, a big salad with a lot of fatty dressing on it. Small, low-fat meals can be helpful. Liquids may be necessary, liquids only, if the symptoms are very severe. And avoid medications that slow down the GI tract, especially the narcotics. If symptoms are really bad, sometimes intravenous feedings, such as uh, TPN or in tube feedings to, into the intestine may be required because it's the stomach for most people that's not emptying properly. And usually, but not always, the small intestine works pretty well. There are medications that are available for gastroparesis, uh, but this slide is, is barely changed from when I first started talking about gastroparesis 10, 15, 20 years ago. Reglan or metoclopramide remains the mainstay of treatment here in the United States, even though it has significant potential side effects. There's another version of Reglan called Domperidone, which is not FDA approved, but it's available in Mexico and Canada. And oftentimes people will order that um, online. Both of those medications stimulate the emptying of the stomach and are fairly effective uh, in many individuals. But again, both can have side effects. 
The antibiotic erythromycin is helpful in the short term because it stimulates the emptying of the stomach, uh, but it too has many side effects and it can cause nausea and vomiting. So it's, it's not a great medicine. Prucalipride or Motegrity was recently approved for use in the United States for treatment of chronic constipation. It stimulates movement of the colon. In addition, it stimulates emptying of the stomach. And we know that it's effective, it has some effectiveness for the treatment of gastroparesis in clinical trials. But it's not FDA approved for gastroparesis. And because it's expensive, it may be hard for you as an individual to get a prescription authorized by your insurance for that. Uh, gastroparesis is really hard to study in clinical trials because the condition is so variable. And the FDA finally has realized that there've been so few medications approved that they need to do something. And there's a big push from the FDA right now to fast track a lot of different experimental medications that may have some benefit in gastroparesis. Nortriptyline is an, a, an antidepressant type medicine that we use for irritable bowel syndrome. It helps with nausea and abdominal pain. It actually slows down the emptying of the stomach, but paradoxically, it may help with the symptoms of gastroparesis, which are bloating, pain, and nausea. Anti-nausea medicines are helpful. Anti-ulcer medicines can be beneficial. And there are all kinds of clinical trials going on right now. So Keep tuned, keep your eyes peeled. There should be some new agents available in the upcoming years. And certainly there are many clinical trials that you could participate in if you wanted to. There is a gastric pacemaker that's available that is occasionally used to help stimulate the emptying of the stomach. And on rare occasions, surgery may be utilized uh, to, to uh, get rid of the the outlet of your stomach to open it up to allow emptying to improve. So I want to move on at this point and switch gears and talk about a topic that has come up very, very frequently and commonly, at least in the patients that I see. And, and this is uh, these are intestinal problems related to abnormalities in the normal bacteria that live in our gut. I'm sure each and every one of you have seen the advertisements uh, or the, the comments in the, in the newspapers and magazines about SIBO. I have so many patients come to me to ask about SIBO, and that stands for small intestine bacterial overgrowth. The other hot topic are dysbiosis or the wrong bacteria living in the wrong places in our guts. And then finally, abnormal bacteria in our gut. But let's talk about small intestine bacterial overgrowth. Our guts have billions of bacteria that normally live within the colon or large intestine. Those bacteria are vital to our existence. They aid in digestion of our foods by breaking down certain food items that our own bodies can't break down. They produce uh, compounds that, that promote gut health, but they also promote compounds that are not so healthy. Some bacteria produce methane, which can cause constipation, and others will produce fatty acids that uh, come from fermentation that can cause diarrhea. We now feel that, that many medical problems are related to abnormal components of the bacteria in our gut. Even diabetes and obesity may be related to this dysbiosis. We know that in experimental models, there are certain strains of mice that are obese, and if you take the bacteria from their intestinal tract and transplant it, transplant it into a mouse that is skinny, that mouse becomes overweight, becomes obese. There's something about the bacteria in that obese mouse that leads to this obesity. Now, we don't know much about this, but there are 
enormous projects going on right now trying to understand the gut microbiome and how it influences diabetes, obesity, and a variety of other conditions. But we don't understand it very well. And the way we try to manipulate the gut microbiome is, is with tools that are not very advanced, things like probiotics, which are gut-friendly bacteria that we don't understand very well, antibiotics to try to change the components of the bacteria in the gut, uh, dietary manipulations that also change the gut in your back, the gut bacteria by manipulating the food items that are coming downstream. So getting back to small intestine bacterial overgrowth, that's a condition where the bacteria, the normal bacteria in the colon go up into the small intestine and, there's, and, and cause all kinds of problems. They can cause bloating, gas, diarrhea. It's very hard to diagnose this. Uh, we can do breath tests, we can try to get cultures, but they're not very reliable. And oftentimes the treatment of small intestine bacterial overgrowth is empiric, meaning we try an antibiotic and see if people get better with it. There are some specific antibiotics that are not absorbed that seem to work better for small intestine bacterial overgrowth than others. I mentioned probiotics, which can be a benefit, and dietary changes, which may be a benefit, including a low sugar diet and the low FODMAP diet, which, which reduces the fermentable food items in your gut. Food items that get fermented in the gut lead to all kinds of problems related to the bacterial fermentation process. There are even people who have bacteria in their gut that ferment sugars to alcohol. And that may be one of the causes why, why people occasionally will develop cirrhosis for no apparent reason. I'm going to stop about now. I mean, this was really a fairly short talk on a few selected issues, gut issues that can affect not only diabetics, but can affect anyone. Gastrointestinal problems are common. That's what keeps me in business. Um, we all have gut troubles that come up once in a while that can be caused by any number of different uh, issues. But if you do have diabetes, you have to be especially careful about fatty liver and all the complications that can occur from that. Gastroparesis, which is really a reflection of neuropathy from longstanding diabetes that, that potentially can be prevented by uh, really having strict control. Uh, most of the GI problems that diabetics get are not strictly related to their diabetes, but are just the sorts of problems that occur with all of us. Heartburn, acid irritation, irritable bowel syndrome, constipation, diarrhea, these are all very common. If your diabetes is very poorly controlled, you're going to be more susceptible to all of those issues. So watch your lifestyle issues, eat a good diet, have a good relationship with your, your physician or your provider. Uh, be careful with your medications. We're going to have a, a session later on today, a question and answer session. And I encourage you to attend that. And if you do have any specific questions, I hope that I can answer those. I hope that this was a worthwhile session. Again, this is not my wheelhouse doing a, a virtual lecture like this but I hope that it did provide some benefit for you and I'm glad to be able to do this. Again, I'm Dr. Jamie Wallison. Uh, I have been a gastroenterologist for many, many, many years. You take care. Thank you.